Ooh, no, if you're looking where this is coming from, this is coming from chapter 32 in your textbook. So I want to just change over to presenter's view. And you're going to see the nervous system, and this comes directly out of there, controls and directs and coordinates all body functions. There's two main divisions. There's the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. So when we're looking at the central nervous system, really you're looking at your brain and your spinal cord. So you may have heard about central nervous system disorders, and we're going to look at those more so either in ongoing conditions along with cognitive impairment here. So the peripheral nervous system includes all the nerves located outside the central nervous system or in the peripheral areas of the body, which they are all connected to the central nervous system. So we have this um, composition of nerve tissue. There's two types of cells. There's neurological cells, and they support the neuron through nourishment, protection, and insulation. And then there's the neurons. The neurons are really, they receive and, perce and process and transmit information, and they're made up of three parts. There's the dendrites, which receive information, the cell body, which contains a nucleus and keeps the cell alive, then processes the information, it's kind of like the brain of the neuron. And then there's an axon that carries information to the next neuron or away from the um, neuron. So when we're looking at how neurons transmit information, the dendrite receives the information, which then sends it to the cell body. The nucleus or the brain in the cell body interprets this information and then sends it to the appropriate axon. Pretty amazing. Don't ask me how it works, but it just does. So how, the neuron, how do neurons transmit information? When the impulses reaches the ends of the axon, it comes to the axon terminals. And this causes a chemical neurotransmitter, so back to the chemicals that we looked at in mental health disorders, to be released into the synapse or the area where the two nerve cells meet. The neurotransmitters are detected by the dendrites in the adjoining neuron causing a response and usually a nerve impulse and then it moves on to the second neuron. So the central nervous system consists of the brain and the spinal cord. The brain is protected by the skull and the spinal cord is protected by our vertebrae. The three main parts of the brain are the cerebellum, the cerebrum, and the brain stem. And these are all made up of neurons with synapses, which is a little space between each of our neurons. So the cerebrum is the largest part of the brain. It's divided into the right and left hemisphere. The right hemisphere is connected with the left hemisphere. Um, and sorry, the right hemisphere is concerned with the left side of the body and the left side of the hemisphere deals with the right side of the body. So it kind of crisscrosses over when you're looking at your um, hemispheres. The cerebral cortex is the outer side of the brain. It's the outer part of the cerebrum. It's called the cerebral cortex and it controls the functions of voluntary muscle movement including speech, pain, temperature, hearing, sight, smell, memory, reasoning, consciousness, and more. And there are specific parts of the primary that are primarily responsible for certain parts of body and specific functions within those body parts. So this is one side of the cerebral cortex. It's mapped out in the body and it shows you there. And this is how the body would look if it corresponded to how much the brain was dedicated to each part. Quite lopsided. Mapping of the cerebrum. Different areas of the brain are involved with different functions. Each area may be more than more or lessly developed in different individuals. This depends on genetics, how much each part of the brain is used, and especially at an early age. Our brains have plasticity, which means the tissue can be developed for different uses. However, after enough time has passed, the functions become more solidified and plastic plasticity decreases. An elder person may have lost significant amounts of this ability. So injury or stroke can result in specific functions being lost depending on which area of the brain is affected. And this just gives you an idea of how the female, um, main, female brain could potentially be mapped, uh, but it's not an accurate map. So when you're looking at our mapping or the brain, which is really cool, we each have a different map. So that is why they do, and I always say, so cool how they did brain um, surgery. 
Um, think about how many people they had to kill before they got it right, but they finally got it right now and they do brain surgery, most of it while you're awake. So they can see what type of and see where the brain is um, needs to be looked at. So the cerebellum, it coordinates body movements, so jerky movements. And I should, before I go into the cerebellum, let me go back to the cerebrum. It gives us our humanness. It gives us our thinking, our reasoning, our logic. It makes us who we are. And the cerebellum is coordinates body movement, jerky, jerky movements, loss of coordination and muscle weaknesses could be a sign of a problem with the cerebrum or cerebellum, sorry. The brain's neck stem connects the cerebellum to the spinal cord, and the brain stem contains messages and relays to the um, areas such as the pons in the midbrain, as well as the medulla. The medulla is concerned with the basic body functions, such as heart rate, breathing, swallowing, coughing, etc. So you'll see that when we're looking at the brain stem, and that's really when we're looking at the brain stem, it looks after our um, basic functions. So if that part is destroyed, then you're going to see that our, um, we would basically die. The spinal cord contains bundles of nerves in pathways that allow information to be relayed to and from the brain. It's enclosed in the spinal column for protection and bundles of nerves enter and exit between the vertebrae. Each bundle serves a certain area of the body. As you move down the spinal column, the nerves exiting also um, move down the body so that the injury to the lower spinal cord affects the lower body and injury to the higher part of the spinal cord affects the higher part of the body. So protection in, of the CNS. The brain and the spinal cord are enclosed in three, have three protective layers of connective tissue called menges. The outer layer is the dura matter. The middle layer is called the arachnoid and the inner layer is called the pia matter. Between the arachnoid and the pia matter is a cushioning fluid called cerebral spinal fluid. Meningitis. Meningitis is inflammation of the menges and subdural means underneath the dura matter. So injuries to the CNS, injuries to the brain or spinal column often result in permanent loss of function. If an area in the brain or spinal column is just being compressed or squeezed um, as a result of increased pressure on the nerves from swelling or bleeding, there may be temporary loss of function, and this can become permanent if the pressure is not relieved quick enough. If complete injury or severing of the nerve occurs in the CNS, damage is considered permanent. The peripheral nervous system is made up of nerves that are outside of the brain and spinal cord. They're bundles of nerves that leave and enter the brain and the spinal cord, and these occur in pairs, one, of each, one on each side of the body. There are 12 of these pairs of, crani of pairs from the brain, which are called cranial nerves. So we have 12 pairs of cranial nerves, and we have pairs, not 24 of them, because they run off the upper part of our spinal cord in our brain, and they are called cranial nerves. And then we have 31 pairs of spinal cord nerves, which are called the spinal nerves. Each bundle of nerves goes to a specific area of the body. We also have another part of the body system, which is really quite interesting. It's called the autonomic nervous system. So what this does, this causes this really automatic or autonomic, it is a specialized part of the peripheral nervous system that controls involuntary functions such as gland secretion, heart rate, blood pressure, intestinal contractions, things that we cannot control. Now I'm not going to say that we can't control we can't control them completely, but we could, when you're looking at the autonomic nervous system, you can decrease your heart rate by breathe, by doing meditation and your blood pressure, but we still don't have the ultimate control our autonomic nervous system does. And, it, and the autonomic nervous system is actually divided into two parts, the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system speeds up when we're excited or scared, anxious, or experiencing strong emotions. It increases our heart rate when you're scared. That's why it re redirects flow to prepare you for a response to whatever is causing the emotion and assists you to protect yourself. 
So that's what the sympathetic nervous system is, the fight and flight or the adrenaline that we have. You've heard about women and men picking up cars when their baby are crushed underneath. The parasympathetic nervous system is more um, active in the absence of strong emotions. It allows functions such as digestion to take place, which is not needed to escape in danger or for the escaping of danger to take place. So you will see that. So the autonomic nervous system is divided into the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system. I think they should be opposite, but hey, when we're looking at, we're relaxing and we are resting, we have the stimulation of saliva, we want to eat, we, our heart slows down, we constrict our our bronchi stimulates peristalsis, so our bowels can empty, and stimulates the release of bile and contraction of our bladder. When we're in that fight and flight, um, or the sympathetic nervous system kicks in, we have dilated pupils, inhibited flow of saliva, we have exhilarated heart rate, increased breathing, inability for peristalsis and secretions to happen, conversion of glucagon, um, into glucose so it does that automatically so we have that energy and the secretions of the adrenal and non-adrenal glands along with it stops us from going to the bathroom so you will see that when our autonomic nervous system is in play the sensory system is another system of a nervous system it can, is comprised of our five senses and their components and these are our sight touch taste smell and hearing so allow our brain to identify and interpret the and interpret these sensations there's a nerve receptors for each sense for example taste buds in the tongue retina in the eyes which both make up nerve cells this information is transmitted to specific areas in the brain for identification interpretation and response of information so when we look at the eye the eye have, we have a retina which is the inner layer of the eye containing receptors for vision and the fibers to the optic nerve. Light enters through the eye, through the cornea, passes through the pupil to the lens, and then it is reflected on the retina and carried to the brain through the optic nerve for interruption or interpretation, sorry. We have eye protection. There's the bones in the skull that help us protect the area around the eyeball. Eyelashes to keep small particles such as dust out. And also they alert us from external danger from entering the eye. Tears help wash out foreign particles and keep our eye lubricated for easy movement. We are the only mammals that um, can cry, actually. Eyelids provide this uh, soft physical barrier for foreign objects. Be aware that these functions are to protect us are not perfect. There's always a possibility of microorganisms entering our body through openings in and around our eyes if these organizes if these organisms come into contact with the eyes through the air or by touch then we could end up with an infection hearing the ear function is not only for hearing but also for balance there's three parts there's the external middle and internal ear so the external ear it or or <laughs> We'll just stop there. When a sound is made, it's close enough to us. The sound waves enter our ear through the external ear canal. Ear wax is produced here to help keep foreign particles out um, that could damage the eardrum. And it is between the outer and the middle ear. That is also an effective um, insecticide when you're looking at your ear wax. The middle ear begins the eardrum which is officially known as the tympanic membrane and this membrane passes vibrations from the sound waves to three tiny bones in the middle ear and these bones amplify the sound before transmitting it to the middle ear the middle ear also contains the eustachian tubes which connect the ear to the throat and allow for drainage of excess fluid from the ear to keep the pressure balanced if the tube becomes blocked pressure can build up in the middle ear causing pain and sometimes an ear infection also known as otitis media. The inner ear contains structures such as the semicircular canals and the cochlea. The cochlea looks like a small tail, a snail, and it contains fluid that carries sound waves to the auditory nerve, which then carries it to the brain for interpretation. The semicircular canals are involved with balance, and they sense the pos position where we are and transmit this information to the brain. 
So taste, we have taste buds and nerves located on our tongue, and they relay information about taste to the brain. Sweet tastes on the tip of the tongue, sour on the back and the uh, back of the tongue, salty is on the side and the front of the tongue, and bitter is across the back of the tongue. There has been a recent controversy about mapping of the taste areas on the tongue. So we'll just keep it as this for now. Smell, olfactory or smell receptors are located in the top of the nasal cavity. Taste and smell are interconnected. The smell of food can influence how it tastes. So touch receptors that receive signals of touch are located in the dermis in the middle layer of the skin. Different areas of the skin are more or less sensitive due to the number of types of receptors presented. So some areas of the skin may be more sensitive to pain, while other areas are more sensitive to temperature. That's why you see mothers fe feeling the forehead of sick children with the back of their hands, because there's receptors there. So changing in the nervous system as we age. Now this isn't with a disease process. Some of our nerve cells shrink or die. Blood flow to the brain decreases. The gilia cells decrease, therefore there's less myelin sheath, slowing the conduction and delaying our responses. And all senses might become diminished. So why we're looking at that and why we need to even look at the nervous system is because when we're looking at the nervous system, you're going to see that it really affects everything. And when we're looking at our different senses, you're going to see that some of them take longer steps to for interpretation. So when you're looking at smell, it just goes in our nostrils, right directly to the olfactory nerve to interpretation. So you'll see that that smell often is a sense because it's a simple pathway. It doesn't become interrupted. So when you're thinking about pathways and when you're looking at our disease processes, please remember that the more pathways something has to follow, the more likely it is to get messed up. So think about when you were playing telephone when you were a young child, or I could do it in the classroom if I start a whisper a conversation or a sentence to somebody at the beginning. After it goes through 25 people, it is messed up. So the more likely to mess something up, the longer path it has. Um, and that even happens in our bodies. So thank you. I hope that helped you. And if it didn't, well, just fast forward me.